The sun goes down in the west and the hero slowly vanishes at the horizon. We know this scene from many stories and films. For a few dollars more from 1965 comes to my mind where we see the legendary Levin Cleave riding into the sunset. But we find something similar in The Searchers from 1956 or even in the Lucky Luke series. While doing research I stumbled upon The Land Beyond the Sunset from 1912. Here the sad protagonist is on a little boat on the ocean in an insanely powerful and sad shot. This short film drama is probably one of the first, if not the first film showing this scene. In my opinion it's also a masterpiece considering it's over 100 years old. But we also see it at the end of the Lord of the Rings films where the elven ship is sailing west into the sunset. In Return of the King we can read and the ship went out into the high sea and passed on into the west. But where exactly do they sail to and more important why do they sail away at all? Just recently Joe the performer asked a question about this topic in the comments and I really liked the idea. The question also goes into the direction of technology in Middle Earth but I'll make a separate video on this at some point. Also I have a little surprise in this video too. Where they go is relatively easy to answer. They sail to the continent in the west called Aman, the blessed realm or the undying lands, on the other side of the great sea or Belegayer. What is very difficult to answer is the why, what and all the details surrounding this continent. Actually even the where the continent is, is more complicated than you might think. At least after the fall of Numenor in the second age but we come to this in a moment. Also note I'll try to pronounce names as Tolkien described it. To answer what Aman is and what makes it so special that all the elves go there at some point we have to go far back in time when Arda was still a young world. If you have seen my video about the white tree of Gondor or the Sauron video you have heard the story partially already. I'm talking about the years of the lamps, lamp as in light source. Arda was once created by God and his so to say angels by making music together in the music of the Ainur. Ainur is so to say the name of the species of spirit beings that serve God which is why I usually compare them to angels. They are divided in at least two groups, Valar and Maiar. The Valar have the highest rank and form something like a God pantheon. Maiar are of lower rank and usually serve a specific Valar. In Lord of the Rings we know several Maiar like Sauron, the Balrog or even Gandalf, Saruman and Radagast. However all made music which created Arda but one Ainu, the evil Valla Melkor brought in dissonance. And here is the little surprise. You shoutouts to Kimberly80 who allowed me to use her stunning artwork in my video. Thank you so much. The link to her deviant art channel is in the description and I also have permission to use her work in future videos. The name Melkor is rarely used in later times where he is known as Morgoth. If you have seen the films Legolas says it's a Balrog of Morgoth. He is not only the master of Balrogs but also the former master of Sauron and Sauron's depiction in the films and games heavily resembles that of Morgoth in the Silmarillion with black armor, a black crown and a giant mace called Grond. He is the first Dark Lord and very crucial for understanding what Aman is or how the continents were formed. Always keep in mind that Tolkien wanted to create his own mythology and in this Arda was intended to be perfect but Melkor brought dissonance into it. When Arda was initially created in this mythology it was flat, had one symmetrical continent already known as Middle Earth and water in its center called the Great Lake. The Valar and their Maiar came to Arda taking a physical shape and helped to form the details of the world you could say. Like forming the Great Lake and an island in its center called Almaren where they lived. They also built two gigantic towers, Iluin and Ormal and placed a hallowed fire on each of them. These are the two lamps which became the light source of the world, also giving this age its name, the years of the lamps. 
Melkor, on the other hand, built his first forge with Utuno in the far north, called Udun in Sindarin. We talked about Legolas and the Balrog in Moria. There Gandalf calls Durin Spain Flame of Udun. It's quite interesting how this scene in Moria references so many mystical things from ancient times. However, with Utuno, Melkor also transformed existing beings into fell creatures and prepared for war. His evil presence brought rot, sickness and most important decay into the world because his goal was to destroy the creation of the others and ultimately Arda itself, everything that was not himself, so quite nihilistic. When the other Valar enjoyed and celebrated the peace of the world up onto this point and were tired from the work forming Arda, he attacked and destroyed the two lamps, the fall of the towers destroyed, the perfect and symmetrical land and tore it asunder, forming the continents and changing Arda forever. This evil influence from the first dissonance during the music of the Ainur and the destruction of the two lamps created a state of the world that is called Arda Mart. We can read about it in the history of Middle-earth's book Morgoth's Ring and Morgoth's Ring is a metaphor from Christopher Tolkien that actually is Arda Mart itself. While Sauron created the One Ring, imbuing it with his own will and evil power to dominate others and preserve his evil power even in his absence, Melkor, the most powerful of the Valar, used much of his power to imbue Arda, the world itself, to taint it with his evil and bring decay and dissonance into it. After this event, Arda becomes Morgoth's one ring and as long as there is Arda, there will be evil in the world, even when Morgoth is bent into the void, which happens at the end of the first age. This is, in my opinion, really crucial to understand what Aman actually is. For the sake of the video's length and because I covered this topic a bit in other videos already, we skip the further shaping of the world. What you need to know, after the two lamps destruction, multiple continents formed. The main continent was still called Middle Earth, but also a new west continent was formed called Aman. The Great Lake formed the oceans like Bele Geyer, the Great Sea. Almarin was completely destroyed and the world became dark, not having a light source anymore. The Ainur now moved to Aman and built their new realm Valinor on it. The Vala Yavanna, Queen of Earth, basically Mother Nature, in addition created a new light source through her song, the two trees of Valinor, and thus began the years of the trees. Shoutouts to the artist Nyati and Benef, who also once allowed me to use their artwork. This is probably a good time to explore the continent Aman a bit, before we go back to the two trees and their significance. Valinor, as mentioned, is the realm of the Ainur. Each Valar had in addition their own dwelling place in Aman, like the woods of Orome, the huntsmen of the Valar, or Lorien, the most beautiful place on Arda, where the Vala Irmo, master of visions and dreams, resides with his wife, Este, the healer of hurts and weariness. Loth Lorien in Middle-earth probably references this place. In the center of Aman we see Valmar or Valimar, which is a mystical city of the Ainur and the two trees were also nearby on the hill Ezelohar, Mahanaxar, the circle of doom where the Valar hold their councils was outside the golden west gate of Valmar. Then in the east is Mount Taniquetil, on its summit the highest place on Arda resides Manwe, king of the Valar, with his wife and queen Valimar. Varda, in his mansion Ilmarin. Ingwe, the high king of all else, later lives at the mountain's foot. In the west we find the halls of Mandos, where the spirits of the dead are summoned to. Somewhere very far into the west is the door of night, through which Morgoth got bent into the void. It's probably also where the sun leaves the world at night, coming back through the gates of morning in the far east of Arda the next day. The elves have several cities too in their realm called Eldamar. Tyrion is the city of the Vanyar and Noldor elves on the hill Tuna. 
At the east coast, the Teleri elves founded their own city, Alqualonde, where the first kinslaying took place. They also lived on the island Tol Eresia for some time before they founded their city. In the tower of Avalone on this island, we also find the master stone of the Palantiri, which is not one of the seven seeing stones that went to Numenor and then to Middle-earth. In the north of Amman was also the Noldor stronghold Formenos, where the Silmarilli were stolen and the high king of the Noldor, Finwe, was slain by Morgoth. These are just some of the many mystical places of Amman, but let's jump back to the two trees of Valinor. Those trees were the new light of the world and the Vala Varda also formed stars out of its dew. The world was still mostly dark during the years of the trees, but now at least the sky had stars and where the Valar lived there was the light of the trees, which was emitted in a specific cycle. One tree was called Telperion, emitting silver light, the other was called Laurelin, emitting golden light. It's hard to put into words how special these two trees in Tolkien's world are. An example, Varda, the Lady of Stars, placed a star constellation called Valakirka into the north to challenge Morgoth at the time when God's first children, the elves, awoke. The stars are connected to the two trees and have, you could say, the same light. Their light challenges the dark and Arda Mart. It's the contrast or the antithesis of Melkor's doing, who just wants dark nothingness. Now with all this combined, the presence of all the Ainur and especially the Valar, them forming their new sacred realm on Aman, the presence of the two trees and stars and later sun and moon, which bring new light into the world once darkened by Melkor and the nature of the Ainur being truly immortal makes Aman and especially Valinor the least marred place on Arda. It's a place where the tainted nature of the world is almost not existent and can be neglected. This also gives perspective on the next step in history, the war for sake of the elves. The elves awoke on Middle Earth where Melkor resides. He finds them first and slowly brings his evil over them. Orome, the huntsman of the Valar, finds them second and sees Melkor's influence. For the sake of the elves, the Valar now attack Melkor's fortress Utumno in the far north, destroy it as much as possible and chain the dark lord with a great chain Angainor, arresting him for three ages in the halls of Mandos. Beyond that they ask the elves to come to Aman to live with the Ainur, initiating the great journey. I explain this in great detail in my Kirdan and the Law of the Elves video, also in my video about languages. But why can't the elves not just continue to peacefully live in Middle Earth? Elves are immortal by nature, so they are beings that almost don't change, but Middle-earth is a place tainted by Morgoth, decay and change is part of it and clashes with the nature of the elves. In contrast, Aman is a place where this decay can be neglected and the Ainur also have the power of healing and preserving. It's a place that does not change as much and the evil power of Morgoth or later Sauron has almost no access to this place, making it quite pure. Of course they try to damage Aman and Morgoth even succeeded one time destroying the two trees of Valinor, while Sauron's success through the fall of Numenor was directed not purely against Aman but primarily towards men. Still they could never undo the nature of Aman. And this is why the elves need to go there. They slowly start to suffer under this clash between the nature of their spirit and Arda Mart. If they stay in Middle Earth, they will start to fade into the unseen or wraith world at some point. Their physical part is tainted too and it also slowly decays in contrast to their spirit. At the same time elves are bound to Arda itself and their body. When they fade, their body vanishes and becomes like a distant memory of their spirit, but elves are not complete without it and so their spirit slowly diminishes too, becoming a wraith. They won't ever fully disappear but are diminished and not complete forever, a terrible fate. Galadriel says to Frodo, 
Yet if you succeed, then our power is diminished and Lothlorien will fade and the tides of time will sweep it away. We must depart into the west or dwindle to a rustic folk of dell and cave, slowly to forget and to be forgotten. What she describes is maybe somewhat comparable to Gollum, but at the end they will even lose their physical form and are ultimately forgotten. Círdan's appearance in the Third Age gives us some hints. We can see aging. He is described as looking old and grey, having a long beard at the end of Lord of the Rings, which is unusual for elves. He is probably the oldest living elf in Middle-earth, but it's my theory that living in Middle-earth for so long increased the decay, which is insanely slow for elves, but in Amman he probably would look younger. This also shows how long fading must take if even Círdan hasn't faded yet. He was also a marina and Morgoth's evil power was not as strong in the oceans and they were less tainted. In addition he wore Narya, one of the three elven rings of power. We come to this in a moment. You could ask why they stay in Middle-earth anyway. The answer is surprising. In Middle-earth they are among the highest, fairest and most powerful beings, while in Amman, the Undying Lands, they are not. There they are just average you could say. Elves can live as long as there is Arda, but living in Middle-earth for such a long time has its price because it's in constant change and elves nature is not to change, which creates sadness and a conflict that they can't overcome as long as they stay there. It makes them wary and they develop a desire to leave Middle-earth at one point. Some even try to counter the marred nature of Arda. The three great elven rings had the power to preserve and reduce decay. Their keepers used them to form places that are not affected as much by the decay and change, like Galadriel with those Lorien or Elrond with Rivendell, where for example hobbits often lose track of time. It makes sense that these elves leave Middle-earth when the One Ring is destroyed and their great rings lose their power, as hinted by Galadriel in the quote I read earlier. This also explains why men are not going to Amman, except for a few exceptions. They received the gift of men, which is death and an unknown future beyond that. They decay, get old and die. Only their spirits are immortal. This does not change even if they would live in Amman. It does not grant immortality by itself. Men are at a constant haste because every second of their limited life is valuable. Their being is probably created to fit into a decaying and changing world. The firstborn elves are not, probably because they were intended for the once perfect and symmetrical world. And Aman is the closest thing to that. So for men it makes no sense to go there and they would just bring decay or Arda Mat with them. As a side note, some people could and will make an argument into another direction regarding the creation of men and their mortality if they consider the discussions of Andres and Galadriel's brother Finrod and the tale of Adanel from Morgoth's ring, but I won't cover them here. This topic is far too complex and can create some conflicts. Interestingly, the idea of elves fading away also reflects mythology, which slowly fades out of the memory of people over time and parts of it and their meaning are lost or diminished you could say. So elves must go to a place that is mythology itself, the place where the two trees once stood, where sun and moon were created, where the high angels live, where living men are not allowed to go with a few exceptions, where spirits are summoned to when their bodies die and where people go that almost never return. In addition, Amman's special nature is underlined by the fact that after the destruction of Númenor, the world was reshaped and became a sphere, with Amman being moved into the unseen realm, which can now only be reached by the elves and their ships on a hard to imagine path called the Straight Road. Still, when they travel on this path, their way leads them into the west, where the sun sets down beyond the ocean. Thank you for watching.
I hope I could elaborate the concept of Aman, the essence of the elves and the meaning of Arda Mart a bit more in this video. It's an intimidating topic to cover and I had to take some shortcuts in my explanations. So excuse me being a bit imprecise at some points, especially with the nature of men. Also a lot of these information are from the book Morgoth's Ring, which are often work in progress drafts and notes of Tolkien, probably never intended to be published. So how can and in this is can be debated but it's also one of the few sources of those details and I tried to connect it to Lord of the Rings. It also felt like I repeated myself a bit too much but I hope you still enjoyed it. I'm also very happy that I got permission from Kimberly80. Her artwork is just so good and I could already use some of it in this video. Getting permissions for artwork seems to be quite difficult because I rarely get answers. Shoutouts to Niati2 who was the first to allow me to use her amazing two trees art last year. Same with Benef. Check their art channels out, I link them all in the description and can't give enough credit to them. If you enjoyed this video and just found my channel, as mentioned, I have more detailed lore videos. Also feel free to press the like button and leave a comment. I always collect lore questions so you can post those too. Interactions help a lot on YouTube so thank you for your support. Next will be another Tolkien related lore video. As announced I focus more on lore for now but I haven't decided on the topic yet. Again thank you for watching and goodbye.